So welcome to our final session on the foundations of social thought. And still we continue with uh, Max Weber's work. Now in this session, I want to concentrate on four things. The spirit of capitalism and the religion and the rise of capitalism. And then Max Weber on his ideas about social stratification and compare briefly Weber and Karl Marx. Now continuing the idea of rationalization, how society becomes modern, how societies become more and more rational and calculative in their, their ways of doing things. The spirit of capitalism, you know, the whole transformation of Europe from the 19th century is about capitalist system of production, industries, factories, marketing, banking, and all that, all in the private hands. So, Maziba talks about the spirit of capitalism. That spirit of capitalism must be understood in the sense that sometimes people tend to think that they are very rational but they may not be rational. Capitalism demands a special type of rationality, which is, in Weber's term, formal rationality. That is, people become so formally organized. People's activities become determined by a spirit, or the spirit of capitalism, as he calls it. That is, people want to make move ahead in life they want profit. And they seek profit meticulously through hard work, not through political means and all that. He's talking about hard work where people exert themselves with certain discipline and attitude towards work so that they want to make money, make money, expand their businesses and all that. That is the spirit of capitalism. So for example, if in your house, your mother has a kiosk, and then daddy helps mommy to have provisions and st to stock the kiosk with whatever she wants to sell. And then mommy runs the shop for a period, and then there's a loss. She hasn't developed the spirit of capitalism. So that is not the spirit of capitalism to Weber. The spirit of capitalism must come in such a way that you will sell those things, make profit, and move on to make profit. So there must be formal rationality in whatever she does. That means that your mom must know what is coming in and what is going out. You know, most of the time, our market women and all that, so some of them don't have that meticulous way of calculating things. But this is what Weber is talking about. That Capitalism, the spirit of capitalism, must be based on meticulous ways of doing things, being calculative, knowing your cost, knowing your benefits or your profits, and moving on. So that spirit of capitalism, he says that it emerged first in Western societies. Western societies like Britain, France, Germany, United States, and all that. That is why the West, the modern, they are so developed. And they are developed because they had the spirit of capitalism. Now, let me say that on this note, Weber was actually looking at the mother's religion. You know, the mother was a Protestant, and in particular, a Calvinist. And he was observing the father's, sorry, the mother's way of worshiping, the, the way they do things and all that. And so he was putting a sociological twist on the mother's religion. Now, because Weber is interested in how the world gets rationalized, how people become calculative, how people make profit and all that, 
he observes certain religions in the world and sees that Protestants, particularly those versions that belong to John Calvin, were the first to indirectly develop the spirit of capitalism. And that that spirit is the one that has transformed the whole capitalist societies and then give them the first position in capitalist development. And that is why to up to today, the, that spirit of making money has done so much on them that they try to rule the world. Now, there are many reasons why that spirit of capitalism will develop. But Weber wants to single out the role of religion, how religion unconsciously created the spirit of capitalism in Western societies. And he observed Protestant religion, Catholic religion, he observed Islam and other Asian uh, religions and came to the conclusion that only the Protestant ethic was able to really develop the spirit of capitalism. And so he showed by evidence that the first generation of millionaires in North America and all that were Protestant and not Catholics. Now this writing is very controversial, but that is the case Weber made. Since making this statement, a lot of religions or uh, some scholars came to the to debate this thesis that was Weber right or wrong, and there are all kinds of evidence pointed to here and there as to it. So it, it remains a very controversial thesis. Now, basically, you know, some time ago I mentioned, if you remember the earlier slides, that the Catholic Church was once so powerful in Europe. But then there was Protestant movement, and so some people moved away from the Catholic Church. And they created Protestantism. So versions of the Protestantism are Anglican, Methodist, Evangelical, Presbyterian, all this. They are all Protestant versions. But there is one that was created by a Swiss clergy, John Calvin. And he called that religion Calvinism. And this is the religion that Max Weber's mother was following, practicing. And so he wants to show that that religion play a role in the genesis or the origin of that spirit of capitalism. So how did he do it? John Calvin had his followers. And then he taught his followers certain principles that they had to follow. And this is the principles that uh, they followed. And Masweba is saying that those principles indirectly encourage the spirit of capitalism. The first important concept in Calvinism is the concept of predestination. Predestination here means that before you are born, God has selected those who are going to heaven and those who are going to, to be damned, those who go to hell. God has made that decision already. So no amount of prayers, fasting, all nights, anointing oils and all that will save your situation. God has made his decision long ago. But interestingly, he taught them something else. Imagine you being a priest and you are followers and you tell your followers that God had made his decision already. Whether they come to church, they do this and that, God will not change. You wouldn't expect your members to come to church because you said God has made the decision already. Why do we go praying? But Calvin taught his followers that they could know whether they are elected to go to heaven or otherwise by observing certain signs around them on earth, the earthly signs. Very simply stated, if you are successful, you are rich, things are good for you in society, 
God has selected you to be in heaven. That is quite strange. Because here we, we often preach that when you are poor, you go to heaven. You know, the whole Protestant movement challenged some of, some of the assumptions of Catholicism. So, what are we seeing? We are seeing a religion that is teaching certain things to people which maybe on the surface of it will be contradicting the ideas that many people have been following. Now, the best thinking is that this created some religious anxiety among the followers. Everyone wants to demonstrate to each other that I am not damned. I am selected to go to heaven. So, indirectly, these preachings, these teachings fuel a certain spirit or a certain attitude towards work. And so he's saying that because of this concern, the Calvinists develop a very positive attitude towards work. They work hard, do not spend their money, they want to reinvest to demonstrate to others that they have the signs that they are going to heaven. So indirectly, Deba is saying that before you become rich, legitimately, genuinely, I don't mean political, affiliating with politics and all that. Before you can be a capitalist, there are certain attitudes you must to fo foster. That you have to discipline yourself. You have to work hard. You have to save money. You must be conscious of profit. You must be able to reinvest. And these are the attitudes that Calvinism indirectly fostered among the people, its followers. So this became like the ingredients, the factors that drove the West to become capitalists. And so the spirit of capitalism and all that. And I'm sure there's, a, there's some wisdom in this sort of way of thinking. Because you see, wherever you see people who want to develop themselves, is that they need discipline. See, some of these rich people we see in Ghana, self-made people, you don't go to them and beg them for money. They will preach the virtues of hard work for you. Now, this religion indirectly encouraged hard work. People saw work as glorifying God. And interestingly, the, the greatest sins you commit under Calvinism is to be lazy is to not work hard, is to be loitering around, use your money on alcohol, women, and all that. These are the sins that Calvinists consider. So, in, you know, in the Catholic religion, it was said, once uh, human beings, Adam and Eve sinned, and they were kicked out of the garden, God told them, go and toil. So work was seen as something people should avoid because it's like punishment. But now the Calvinists have restored work to a center stage. And so work was seen as a vocation. And actually, Calvinists don't like long worship. They will tell you that even the workplace is a place through which you glorify God. So you begin to see that they've scaled down on time spent on religion. Calvinists will not bother going to church two hours, come and open their shop. These are attitudes that Weber is saying that they emerge indirectly from Calvinist doctrine and fuel the spirit of capitalism in the Western societies. And so they began capitalist development before any other, other society. Now, these things are very interesting for us because from the Calvinist point of view, of the Weberian way of saying it, do you see our religions in Africa as encouraging those kind of attitudes, positive orientation towards work? Do we spend too many hours in church shouting, whereas maybe we should be working as the Calvinists would do? In what way do our churches, preachings, encourage
productive, hard work, meticulous work attitudes. I leave that for you to answer. Now, Weber is not saying that religion and law alone give rise to capitalist development. Actually, he had other factors coming, but he just singled out the role of the religion in this capitalist transformation. He gave, in another instance, he gave the role of the state and institutions in the genesis of capitalism, which is, is also very interesting because when we mean the, the role of the state and institution, we mean a state that, first of all, is a rational state. I hope you remember the concept of rationality. A rational state is a state that is manned by people who are conscious about their actions for the larger society. They are the ones who want to develop rules and regulations that actually make society fair. So maybe our state today, I don't know to what extent is rational. I don't think it's rational at all because the people who man the state, they don't appeal to rationality. Again, the state is a bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy, favoritism, matter of who you know, cutting corners. When a state is not rational, it can't rationalize society, and so the societal development cannot be rational. It can hold back development of society. So Weber, if you read Weber very well, he also talks about social stratification. For example, when we say social stratification, we want to say that we can we can arrange people in social ladder. Okay, we can stratify people. People, some people are upper class, middle class, middle lower, lower class. You know that kind of arrangement of people. We uh, we do those arrangement of people on the basis of income, well, income and wealth, prestige and power. These are the variables. Because society does not give income, it doesn't give wealth. Uh, it doesn't give power or prestige to all occupations. Those who have more of this will be in the upper level. Those who have less will be in the lower level. So if I earn more income than you, then I am upper. Or the property, the cars, the mansions, all that I have, which is my wealth, is more than yours or I have prestige attached to my occupation. If I have more of those, I am the upper level or the ladder of society. And maybe you are low. So sociologists often talk about social stratification, how society is stratified in layers. If we look at Karl Marx's work, for Karl Marx, society exists in two main categories the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So we have only two groups of people in society in terms of uh, when we re read Marxism or mass ideas. But Weber thought that classifying people in just bourgeoisie and proletariat is oversimplified. So he wants to introduce new factors. He agrees with Marx all right, but he said no, we should go beyond that because we have people who can come up or down on the basis of certain variables like status, class, and you know, a political party and all that. So on the issue of social inequality or social stratification, Weber and Marx have different things they are saying. Now, on the issue of religion, you recall, Marx, Karl Marx says that religion is the opium of the masses. Okay, you remember. Masveva is saying that some religions rather promote capitalist development, in this case, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism originated from the teachings of John Calvin. So on this issue, and many more, people often think that Weber and Marx 
are contradicting themselves or even opposing each other. Because Weber came later than Marx, some people drew the conclusion that Weber's work is a posthumous dialogue with the ghost of Marx. Because Marx is dead and gone, so some of the writings of May Weber appears to be countering the writings of Karl Marx. So I've talked about Weber and social stratification. I've talked about religion. One person sees religion as promoting development. The other thing is that is the opium of the masses. So, but in modern times, we, use, we want to think of them as complementing each other. So it is not like this or there, but we see in sense in all their contributions. So we see that where Marx, for example, falls short, Weber tries to fill in the gap. So we should not see Weber and Marx work as standing in opposition to each other. So these are some of the leading ideas from Max Weber. We have talked so long, we've come a long way. I, I want to say that the funders is not that we prefer this to this. It's not that uh, one is more smart, is smarter than the other. But we, in sociology, we want to see all of them as providing various angles from which we can look at issues in society, describe our society, analyze, and see where we are heading to. So we should see them as complementing each other. And uh, in, the, in, in knowledge production, there is not one way of doing it. Sometimes they are saying the same thing, but with different concepts and all that. What appeals to them or appeal to them in those days, it depends on, depended on everybody's interest. How do we get a grip on society? How do we understand how people f behave in society? What motives? Is it society that is driving us or we have our own volition that we can work with? Or is our society tending to be better? Is society full of competition? Is society rationalizing itself and all that? So we have to read all of them as having existed in a particular phase, having experienced the same rapidly changing context, seeing consequences, predicting the future, and all that. So these are the ideas, the basic ideas, which we refer to as the foundations of sociological theory. And uh, from here, sociology spread throughout other nations and also through the developing countries as a, pro as, as a result of colonization and all that. So we must understand our society also from such perspectives to be furnished as a very broad array of ideas and all that which we can use. So if you go to church, for example, maybe you want to see, is the church becoming the opium of the masses? Then you are a masist. If you live in s uh, the world and you feel you are so concerned about social injustice, poverty, exploitation, and you want to make a change, you are, you, you are thinking like Karl Marx. If you want your society to be fair, to be rational, to develop, what role can the state play? What role can agents, human beings, governments, what kind of attitudes do we need to develop so that we move society forward, increase productivity, don't lazy about, Mas Weber has said something for us. So I would say that there's much application, we can use application of, uh, we can find the application of the ideas in our society. So on that note, I want to end it here. I trust that you read the books prescribed for you and also you study hard. I think you agree with me that sociology is a very interesting and sometimes 
uh, what do you call it, sometimes a, a subject that actually turns our well around. Certain things we believe in, when we study sociology, we tend to re-examine them in a new light. Sociology offers a perspective for examining or re-examining a familiar world that we all live in. It can debunk some of the things we know, but it can also open up new ideas for us. I wish you well.